When you think of the word power, does it come with positive or negative connotations? Perhaps you're thinking about all the good things political power has delivered, such as universal education, health care, or security. Or maybe you view power as an expression of personal vanity, egotism, or worse. If you're in the latter category, you might be encouraged by a new book. It's called The End of Power, From Boardrooms to Battlefields and Churches to States, Why Being in Charge Isn't What It Used to Be. It's Mark Zuckerberg's first choice in a series of books he'll be reading and recommending to his 31 million Facebook friends. And with that, we welcome back to TVO in Washington, D.C., the book's author. There's Moises Naim. It's great to have you on TVO again, Moises Naim. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Delighted to be with you again. Tell us, first of all, off the top, how did you find out that Mark Zuckerberg had uh, given you the good housekeeping seal of approval? <laughs> It was a complete surprise. I didn't know that that was going to happen. I don't know him. Uh, and so I just uh, woke up one morning, and I think it was January 2nd or 3rd, and I started looking at my Twitter feed, and I saw that there was a lot of uh, comments about that, and I didn't know what it was. And then I discovered uh, that he had picked my book uh, as the first book uh, of his book club. And that uh, was a... I, a huge uh, boost uh, for the visibility of the book, of course. Okay, let's start with the moment that you realized, as we start discussing power here, when you realized that isn't what you thought it would be. You are a high-ranking cabinet minister in Venezuela. You've just won a big electoral victory. You think you have this big mandate and therefore lots of power to do the things that you got elected to do. What did you learn right away? that I didn't have that much power, that you know, people would come and meet with me and say, uh, tell me things that they were expecting me to do, and I agreed with them, and then tried to, to do them, and I couldn't. I didn't have the resources, the money, the budget, the institutional capabilities, the staff, uh, the interagency coordination. I had all sorts of restrictions. And at the beginning, I just chalked it down to my inexperience. I was a technocrat. I was 36 years old. And I just thought, well, what happens is that you don't, you know, you're not uh, equipped to do this job. Then I talked to my colleagues that were far more experienced. And uh, you know, they would uh, confess that uh, more or less the same thing happened, but that you never should uh, let people know that you are not powerful, because that will make you even less powerful. <laughs> And so, and then I thought it was uh, related to my country, Venezuela, that uh, had a, a very inefficient uh, uh, public sector, and I thought it was that. I was then, uh, after a while, I became, uh, I went to the world, to work uh, to the World Bank, and there I, uh, I exchanged ideas, and I had to talk with the cabinet members uh, from Africa and Asia and around the world. And uh, again, we were asking them to do things that were very sensible, that made sense, they agreed, and then they couldn't do it. And then I discovered that this was a far more universal trend that I had anticipated. But of course, the problem is you have the title, and so everybody thinks you have that power. How do you deal with the disconnect, which is what you learned, that you actually don't have that much power? Are you talking about political power of people in office? Are you talking about yes, cabinet exactly. members? Or are you talking about uh, CEOs of large companies, which I argue in the book that that's the case for them too, or generals, that uh, even generals that uh, command large armies and sophisticated technologies, or uh, churches, and, uh, and, 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 or huge foundations and philanthropic institutions. I claim that in all of those institutions, uh, where power matters, uh, power is now uh, becoming more constrained. Although you do say power is easier to get, harder to use, and easier to lose. So let's pa unpack that a little bit. How do you mean power is easier to get nowadays? Well, just look around at the examples. Every day uh, you, you, can, you, you find examples in the news media. Just think about uh, ISIS. Uh, you know, if we were having this conversation a year or two ago, that would mean, mean nothing. And just it turns out that all of a sudden, this military force uh, appears and is transforming uh, the Middle East, or at least there's a swath of, of, of territory between Syria and Iraq, and is creating a whole new dynamic. Think about a political party like in Greece, Syriza. 
uh, that uh, won the election. And it, it, you know, that party was not that important. It just emerged recently. In Spain, there's another political party called Podemos, just, just uh, uh, you know, less than a year uh, or so uh, old. And it's already a force that is transforming politics in, um, in Spain. And again, I can uh, mention examples of the same trend of new arrivals, what I call in the book micropowers that are young, that are agile, that play with a different playbook, with a, use different scripts, and that they are a, able to uh, take power from uh, uh, long-established players and very powerful players that I call uh, the mega players. So the mega players are being attacked by these micro powers. Okay, easier to get, harder to use. You've explained that as well. How about easier to lose? Why is power easier to lose nowadays? Because the shields that protect the powerful uh, are becoming less protective. Uh, in order to have power, you have to have uh, unique assets or unique conditions. Uh, if you are a political party, you need to have a lot of followers and an organizational structure. If you are a private uh, business, you either have a lot of capital or you have a technology or an alluring brand. Uh, if you are a religion, you have a lot of uh, followers and believers. Uh, if you are, have an army, you have unique weapons uh, and capabilities. Well, all of those things these days are not enough uh, to protect you from uh, the rivals that want to take uh, part of your power away or all of your power away or the pushback from the subjects of which, over which you have power. Well, let's do another example. This one's kind of amusing from the world of chess. You tell us there were 88 grandmasters in 1972. Today there are 1,200. What does that tell you? And no, it's not just that you have skyrocketing numbers of grandmasters, it's their provenance. It used to be that the top tier of uh, world-class chess players came from the Soviet Union. And now you have uh, people from China and uh, Argentina and Poland and India and uh, from around the world. And you also have uh, women that are uh, world-class players. And, uh, and again, they are uh, appending the historical structure, high, the, stru the traditional hierarchy of uh, power in, in the chess, in the world of chess, is being appended by more competition and by, again, by the fact that uh, the unique assets that the, the, the masters had uh, no longer shield them from, in, from new rivals that, that attack the incumbents. What's your theory as to why all this is happening now? Because the barriers that protect uh, the, the powerful are being um, overwhelmed, uh, uh, circumvented, uh, and eroded by what I call the three revolutions. One is the, what I call the more revolution. The second is what I label the mobility revolution. And the third is the mentality revolution. The more revolution is my way of combining all of the variables uh, that show that we live in an age of profusion. There are more countries, of course, far more people, uh, people that, uh, you know, it took us, uh, took humanity until uh, 1950 to reach the 2 billion uh, population mark. And now we add 2 billion every 20 years. So there's a lot of people, but these people are also the youngest, uh, uh, much younger Younger. We are living in the youngest uh, planet in the world in terms of population. Of course, unevenly distributed, there are places where uh, people, are, uh, you know, populations are, quite, are graying and are quite old. But on average, in the planet today, there's plenty of more people and young, and they're urban, and they're better educated, they're, they have better uh, uh, food, uh, they, they are more informed, um, they, and, and they, there is plenty of uh, everything, companies and ideas and political parties and uh, foundations and philanthropists and terrorists uh, and, uh, and no deference uh, to authority. criminal gangs. And no deference yeah. to authority. So, Right, and so you know, it's uh, it's easier to uh, to have uh, power, impose power over a hundred people than over a thousand people. And if those thousand people are better educated, are better fed, are better informed, are better, uh, and have uh, uh, more real uh, uh, opportunities, it's very it's much harder. So th the more revolution essentially is overwhelming the barriers that protected uh, I the powerful, and then the mobility. All of these things move more. 
Hmm. I think your uh, thesis certainly resonates with the 43rd president of the United States because when he was asked in one of his exit interviews uh, what was the most surprising thing about the presidency, George W. Bush answered, how little power I actually have. And I wonder if you could comment on that in, in so far as this was a man who launched a war in Afghanistan, he launched a war in Iraq, and he says he's surprised at how little power he has. How do those two things make sense combined together? Well, because uh, it, it is perfectly valid and possible, perfectly possible that he had enough power to launch the war on Iraq. But then look what happened. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 he didn't have the power to really uh, win that war. You know, uh, it, the country fragmented. Uh, exactly what I described in the book happened in Iraq. You had a bunch of new players uh, that, that just dealt uh, with the situation in a completely surprising different uh, way, uh, uh, using different tools, different weapons, uh, uh, the IEDs, the uh, improvised explosive devices, that are homemade bombs became uh, the main uh, weapon of war for the insurgents. Um, so, you know, power became uh, much uh, fractured and, and diffused and continues to be the case there. Uh, in Iraq. And, and by the way, President Bush is not the only one that have said that. In the book, I have uh, comments uh, and by a variety of presidents, from President Bill Clinton to President Fernando Enrique Cardoso from Brazil, that they also uh, recognize that that's a trend. And President Obama, uh, in several interviews, has uh, mentioned that too. How much of it, though, in your view, is a lack of authority in the office versus a lack of authority by the office holder? I think it's structural. I think uh, it has uh, less to do with personalities and more to do with uh, the kinds of forces that I describe in the three revolutions that are present regardless of uh, uh, who is sitting in the office. Of course, I'm not denying that individual uh, per characteristics and charisma and uh, style and, and all the factors uh, are irrelevant. I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying that they are irrelevant, but I'm saying that there is a structural uh, determinant, set of determinants that limit uh, what a, a, a powerful person can do today. I'm not denying that power does not exist and the world is not, uh, does not have pockets uh, of highly concentrated power. You know, the President of the United States and Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping in China and big banks and big uh, IT companies like Google and Facebook, all of those places um, have a lot of power. What I'm saying is that they have more limits on what they can do with it. I should ask, though, whether or not you believe, I think, what used to be the case, namely that size was power. Is that no longer the case, that size and power no longer go hand in hand? Absolutely. Uh, just let me give you an example. Uh, think about Kodak. Uh, who doesn't have a Kodak moment, a picture? Um, Kodak was the dominant company in photography, imaging, uh, uh, cameras and all that. Well, Kodak is bankrupt. Kodak uh, is no longer. And at the same time that Kodak, this huge company that dominated its business for almost a century, went out of business, a company that had only 13 employees and had been in existence for three years was sold for a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. That company was in the same space uh, as Kodak, and it's called Instagram. And what it had, it had agility, it had a new technology, it moved in a different way. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that uh, Kodak went down and went bankrupt because of Instagram, but I'm just comparing a huge, giant, multinational company, the dominant company, and a newcomer, a, star a startup that just uh, was agile and quick and, and played with a different strategy, used a different strategy. In fact, if you look at things geopolitically, you could say, with the Americans in Vietnam, with the Soviets in Afghanistan, uh, with ISIS in the Middle East right now, with Russian separatists in the eastern part of Ukraine today, would you even go so far as to say that the underdog has the advantage in the way the world works today? Well, yes and no. What I'm going to say is that the large armies, the large military establishments, uh, have, um, um, are, have less options. What these new micropowers 
like the ones you mentioned, or the Taliban, or all these insurgents around the world are doing, is denying the traditional armed forces, the large military establishments, options that they took for granted in the past. The Pentagon continues to be a mighty force, but the Pentagon today has restrictions on what it can do, uh, because there are these uh, micropowers that limit uh, the options it used to have. But I wonder if uh, Vladimir Putin and his actions, in some respects, are the antithesis to your book. He has found power easy to get. He has not found it difficult to, to use. He has had an easy time hanging on to it, not difficult to lose. And he's making, uh, certainly from Western eyes, lots of trouble all over the world today. What do you think? Yeah, no, I disagree with that. And in fact, I have written uh, an article about that uh, recently. Uh, oh, he is very powerful, and he can get away with doing a lot of uh, things that he wants. But uh, Putin today is uh, dealing with an economy that is very frail, uh, with sanctions. Uh, you know, he managed to unify Europe uh, to impose sanctions on him. Uh, he has alienated uh, uh, countries that uh, used to be the bridge and the main interlocutors uh, between Russia and Europe. For example, I'm thinking about Germany, of course. Um, and he has a middle class that is becoming restive. Uh, as I said, his economy is uh, going through a very difficult time and will continue to go uh, through a difficult time as, as a result of uh, sanctions be by the US and the European Union, and also because of falling oil prices. So at some point, uh, the bad economic situation is going to create uh, a lot of unhappiness on the large middle class that has emerged in Russia in the last decade or two. There's a word in your book that I confess I hadn't seen before I read it in your book, and that is, and I'm, I hope I'm saying it correctly, vitocracies. Is that it? Right. Our democracies, is you tell us, are in danger of becoming vitocracies. What is that? That's a term that was coined by Professor Frank Fukuyama at Stanford. Uh, and it uh, tracks with why, what I argue in the book, and that is that in political systems, in democracies, you, we are seeing around the world the proliferation of political players that may not have uh, uh, the power to take over uh, the government, but do have the power to block uh, the initiatives of those in government. We have seen it in the United States uh, with uh, the Tea Party. We have seen it in Europe. In Italy, for example, it was very common that you had all kinds of, of uh, political parties, some of them quite small, but just uh, with enough power to uh, become kingmakers or decide things. In Israel, uh, we also see that. And, and so that is why around the world we see a lot of gridlock in decision making in democracies or decisions that are uh, delayed or diluted or uh, are, are taken, you know, trying to please everybody and it's uh, the minimum common denominator that looks like a decision but is surely not a solution to the problem that it was supposed to tackle. Well, let me push back on that a bit because I know I've read George Will say things like, the building behind you, in that capital. It was designed for gridlock. It was designed to make sure that no supreme ruler could get too far out ahead of everybody else and, and rule a country to his will. And that the decentralizing of power is exactly where it's at, and that's a better way to go. What do you think? That che we, we have gone crazy on checks and balances. We, we have overdosing. We are overdosing on checks and balances. Of course, you need checks and balances are the essence of a democracy. You need to have separation of powers, and you have to make sure that each of the powers checks on each other and limits uh, the concentration of power, excessive concentration of power on any of the branches of government. Of course, that's the foundation of democracy. But uh, in a lot of countries, what's happening, what is happening is that uh, they are overdoing it, creating the gridlock, creating the point in which uh, a country like the United States and the building behind me uh, was, uh, sh was uh, shutting down the functioning of the government. Uh, it was about to bring a global financial crisis because it was no, go, not going to authorize um, or approve the, 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 you know, the fiscal cliff conversation that we had in the country, the emergency, in which it was unclear if the United States was going to honor its debts. And that would have a global uh, uh, ripple effects around the global economy. We, had, uh, we saw all of that. And that is not checks and balances. That is checks and balances become 
becoming a vitocracy, becoming you know, a small group of radical extremist players that say, you know, we may not be a majority, but we can surely block the activities of government. And that is a global trend. And that is what uh, we need uh, to be um, careful about. And it's rooted in um, another global trend, which is lack of trust. In a lot of places, uh, there is a profound lack of trust. There is huge polarization, uh, political polarization. And uh, if you don't trust uh, others, you impose all kinds of constraints to, um, to stop them from acting. Given the city that you're in right now and that building behind you, the Capitol Dome, which might be the most political building in the whole world, I, I should ask you about what you think the state of contemporary political parties is. What's your view on that? My view is that uh, uh, political parties are deservedly have lost allure, uh, have lost attractiveness. Uh, they are no longer the natural home for idealists, uh, for people that want to change uh, the world, their city, their country. And that is a tragedy. Uh, and because you cannot have democracy without political parties. Um, and political par since the end of the Cold War in the in 90s, beginning in 1990s, if you will, uh, political parties have had a terrible run. And uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, or movements, or social movements, or social activists have had a great run. So if you are a young, idealist, uh, energetic individual who wants to make change for the good, you don't join a political party. You are most likely to join a non-governmental organization or a movement of some kinds and so on. Um, and, and that needs to, to change. Not that we don't need the NGOs and the movements, but we need stronger, more attractive, uh, more modern uh, political parties. People don't go to political parties because they believe very often uh, correctly that political parties are oligarchic, they are exclusionary, they only attract uh, careerists, uh, uh, people that, are, that care more about their own uh, uh, career and use political parties just uh, uh, as a step to go into government, uh, and not because driven by uh, the, the will to do better uh, or to, to do good. And, uh, and so we need, uh, it's very important that, that political parties uh, begin to uh, or regain the ability to attract the idealist. And if those that already exist cannot change, then others should come uh, and provide that. Uh, those other groups you mentioned, though, have a lot of very faithful adherents behind them. The Republican Party, the Democratic Party, I suspect a lot of conservatives, liberals, New Democrats, and Greens in Canada have lost the faith. So how do we get it back? Well, by innovation, I, I, I do believe that we are at uh, the doors of a uh, wave of political innovation. If you think about uh, how we live today, you know, since we wake up in the morning to we, when we go at bed, at bed, uh, to bed at night, there is all kinds of things that have transformed our life, the way we communicate, the way, uh, you know, our health is, uh, you know, innovation in about everything has disrupted uh, businesses, uh, institutions, institutional uh, work uh, functioning, it has created new opportunities. So innovation is around. The, the human condition is being transformed by innovation in almost everything, except the way we govern ourselves, hmm. the way we pick our leaders, the way we monitor our governments, the way we participate in collective decision making, in politics. So innovation across the board, in everything except in the way we govern ourselves. And that has to change. That will change because I think there is a wave of uh, political innovation and governing innovation that it's about to hit us. The name of the book is The End of Power, From Boardrooms to Battlefields and Churches to States, Why Being in Charge Isn't What It Used to Be. Moises Naim, we always enjoy your visits to our program. Thanks so much for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.